Good morning again, and uh, welcome to our second session um, on paratransit day that will be dedicated to the South African experience uh, in terms of paratransit professionalization. Uh, my name is Simon Sadier. I'm with the Africa Transport Policy Program, that's SSATP. Um, hi to the online uh, audience. And so I'm the urban mobility pivot lead uh, with, with SSATP. Um, thanks a lot for, for being here. Um, this morning for the second session, we have um, six speakers. We'll have a, here a welcome address from the SSATP program manager, Mustafa Ben Mamar. Um, then we'll have um, Edward Bukus uh, sort of give us some context on the paratransit. Um, and urban mobility more widely in South Africa. Then we'll hear about uh, a pilot project and very exciting uh, pilots that's currently being rolled out in uh, Pretoria um, with the support of, of uh, the World Bank and DBSA. Um, and we'll hear both from the, let's say, the operational and the organizational side of things with uh, Nico McLaughlin. And then the point of view of, uh, of a financier on the kind of opportunities this type of, of, uh, of pilot and of transformation can unlock uh, with uh, Cyprien uh, Moreau. Then we want to widen the discussion a little bit and hear perspectives from other African uh, cities on how much of this could be replicable um, in our country, in our cities? What needs to be adapted? What are the differences? What did we do differently that South Africa could, could learn uh, from us about this? Um, and then, uh, so for that part of the discussion, we'll have Amanda Gabirano, whom some of you heard yesterday in the paratransit session, um, who uh, is both with the National Planning Commission in Uganda, but also the independent chairperson of the paratransit consultative forum in Kampala. And we'll hear, we're very privileged to have joining us remotely from Dakar, uh, we'll have the Director General of CETUD. So CETUD is the Dakar uh, Transport Authority. They're currently rolling out the first 100% uh, electric BRT on the African continent. And as you know, have a long history of um, working with the paratransit industry to, to professionalize it. Um, and uh, uh, in particular for complete renewal programs. Um, so, but to get us started, um, I'd like to welcome uh, Mustafa Ben Mama, who, as I said, is the, um, a, a lead uh, transport specialist with the World Bank and the program manager of SFATP. Um, he's worked in three regions um, at the bank since 2004 and was previously a transport economist in the UK uh, before joining the bank. The bank. Mustafa, over to you. Thank you. Well, I haven't prepared any speech. Uh, just to say that uh, SSATP, we work in the uh, five year cycle. Uh, cycle we have been started about a year ago. And we have a previous uh, safety, regional integration, in urban mobility. And within urban mobility, um, our transit capacity building is really the centerpiece of our work. We started in the previous uh, cycle by a uh, working paper offered by Sam, Silver Language, Dan Gudas, and Majid for the myths and reality as a starting point. And then we move in forward uh, for the cycle. We started a couple of uh, webinars. We have a uh, Two studies coming up. One is to look at the fleet renewal in in few cities in Africa, and there is one uh, nearly completed uh, that looks at the state of uh, urban mobility authorities. So mm -hmm. it's a big agenda for us, and I'm so so glad uh, that we are here today to discuss specifically this topic. We started uh, yesterday with an appetizer. We've got a lot of, lot of uh, good feedback, uh, and I hope we're going to carry on on the same uh, vein. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before reintroducing our first speaker, I also want to acknowledge the amazing support we've gotten uh, from the team. Uh, Kauri Nina, our, our team. 
did most of the heavy lifting towards the organization of this session. And uh, of course, uh, uh, Connie, uh, our uh, pro team assistant who's following online. Uh, thank you, Connie, as well. So to get us started, um, I'm going to invite uh, Edward Dukas, who's a senior transport specialist uh, with the bank, to, to take the floor. Um, he's been working in the transport sector across Southern Africa for uh, 20 years, uh, over 20 years. He's an engineer by training and also has a PhD in transport planning. Um, so, um, Edward, can you please introduce us to the South African urban mobility context and in particular to the role of the minibus industry in this context? Over to you. Okay. Uh, let me stand up. Thank you. Uh, I am, uh, as I'm in the Bucus, I'm a transport specialist here at the bank, and I'm task team lead for this uh, green visible advisory services contract that we have with EDSA. So we've been running now 2019, I think. Uh, oh, 2019 or 2020. We don't count. We don't, yeah. <laughs> it's been extended once, né? So, uh, but it's it's been a, it's been a long road. Um, we have a series of three presentations that we're going to give. Uh, I'm going to be contextualizing the situation and what led up to us actually taking on this work. Uh, Nick is going to dive into the detail of what we are doing in Pretoria, and Sabrina will give that overall DFI perspective and the way forward as they see it. Um, so let me just, thanks. Okay. So in terms of the state of play for transport in South Africa, as it stands now, so around the COVID period, um, we have the majority of people who use public transport, uh, using minibus taxis. Uh, this is modes of transport to work and education, more than 70%. Um, on the other side, we've got the modal split overall. Um, in South Africa, it's from the National House of Travel Survey in 2020. Uh, we've got most people actually walk, 44% of people walk all the way to wherever they're going. Uh, and then there's a split of about even 28% between public and private. But for those people who do use public transport, uh, at least in 2020, uh, when this data was collected, 77% used minibuses. It's gotten more. We estimates are now that we're looking at over 80% now since COVID. 83, 84% is the numbers that's out there now are using the minibus tax. So, if you then start looking at, well, how is transport funded? This is public transport funding in South Africa out of this latest budget. There's about 2 billion US dollars in South Africa set aside in the budget this year for public transport overall. Um, and this is only from the national fiscal side, so this doesn't go down to municipal budgets where there's additional money. Um, but you can see bus rapid transit capital subsidy uh, is about 370 uh, million US dollars. Then you've got commuter bus operating subsidy, about 403. Railways gets a huge chunk, more than 50% goes towards the operating subsidy for rail and the capital allocation for rail. Uh, then there's Cow Train, which is also a rapid rail service. There's a patronage guarantee on that one, you know, because um, it's a PPP. Uh, they get about 118 million. And that, this little green slice here, the 26 million over there, is for the taxi recapitalization fund. That's pretty much all that they get, right? Now, I mean, I wish we could kind of flip back to the last slide so you could see this picture versus the number of people that they're actually moving. 83%, uh, there's a disjuncture, right? Okay. Then uh, we look at, okay, so what are we buying for all of that money, right? Because you spend all this money on rail, this is rail, right? More than half of your budget 
How many people are you actually moving? Now, back in the heyday, <coughs> in the 90s, uh, there's a lot of people. Cape Town is the blue line, or the green line, and then the blue line is sort of, you have to multiply by another thousand, and then you get the blue line, that's the national. So in Cape Town, which has got a substantive railway system, commuter rail system, 700,000 more or less across the day. I mean, that's dropped off to next to nothing, right? But they get, all of this money gets pumped into the system. Uh, and it's not delivering value. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. Around 2006-2007, when um, uh, we were preparing to host the World Cup, uh, it came from before that, but there was a lot of initiatives and there were so-called legacy projects. BRT in South Africa was one of those sort of legacy projects and it was meant to address um, what was well understood from the 90s already, urban transport is very important. So we've got a really robust policy structure uh, driving improvements in urban transport. This was one of the first large capital programs that government put in place. This and then the rail modernization program that they've been pumping money into uh, for a decade or more uh, to try and replace uh, to a large extent, the minibus taxi and the old commuter bus systems, which I showed you is still being funded at least in the, in the budget of this year. So BRT was supposed to be the silver bullet. There were delegations from all across South Africa that went on trips to Bogota and South America, you know, and said, okay, this is, and so we're doing this, right? Um, and so that led to this massive program, 13 cities in South Africa, have got BRT programs at various points, all state funded, because our country doesn't really, uh, at the time, it's changing now, but they, they don't really like lending. Uh, so 13 cities undertook these BRT programs. We now have one, two, three, four that are operating, Cape Town, Johannesburg, there's one in Pretoria, uh, and there's like a BRT light service down in George, uh, there are two more that have limited operations, trial type operations, Port Elizabeth and Ekuruleni, which is uh, where Janusburg Airport is, so it's basically part of Janusburg. Then we've got uh, plenty that are under construction in various phases, some for a very long time. Uh, Durban has got a route that they finished construction on four years ago, I think now. They have not started running buses. Um, the same in Mumbela, they, they've done their bus routes, they've built this massive public transport interchange there, there's nothing going on. Uh, I don't know where uh, Buffalo City is, is London. Rustenburg is also sort of a bit of a sad case. BRT routes built, buses purchased, nothing happening. Um, then there are several that are in planning. I'm not sure about Polokwani, but I think Polokwani is in planning. Uh, Peter Maritzburg down on the, on the west coast, so they've fallen off the map to a certain extent with their planning. And Bloemfontein, there's quite a lot that I'm hearing in the news now about Bloemfontein picking up. That's the one in the middle. So a lot of effort, right? A lot of money. Next one. Uh, and how are they doing these services? So far, since the launch of the program, our country has spent 4.24 billion US dollars on its BRT program. That's a large sum of money in anybody's language, but for a middle-income country like ours, it's a particularly massive sum of money. Um, and what did we get? The verdicts of the systems that are running or partially running, and this is recent data. I have not included the data from the COVID years because that was, you know, it's different. Um, so this is pre-COVID. This was when they were performing at their peak, right? Um, and Ria Valia, the system in Joburg, moves around 55,000 people a day. My city, Cape Town, is on the decline, budget constraints, cut back on routes, that kind of thing. They were at 70, just over 70, and they're also down to 50,000 odd now. So ridership is declining, uh, despite ongoing investment. And then the others, I mean, they're sort of just filling up the numbers at the bottom here. But to put this in context, 
if you add up all of this ridership across all of these systems together, right, you're still not at what Dar es Salaam one route moves in a day. So, really, they're not moving much people after spending $4 billion. So now, turn to the paratransit sector. Um, there's been a shift. I'll tell you about the shift in South Africa. People are beginning to think about this differently now. Uh, Nanga had the slide as well, but I think it's worth reiterating. This is the predominant public transport mode in South Africa, and I would argue overwhelmingly dominant in Africa. But, and it continues to grow, by the way. I told you it's gone from 77 in, in 2020 to well over 80% now, so it's growing. Um, about 50 billion rand a year in revenue, at least, you know, it's conservative. Um, the vast number of people moving it, uh, using it, uh, work, school, university, more than 15 million daily commuter trips. By comparison, I mean, the other modes I've shown now, they don't really even feature in comparison to this. Um, and we have also, again, an estimate, no one really knows, at least a quarter of a million of these vehicles operating in South Africa. They do long distance services, they do school runs, they do commuter services, <laughs> a whole range of things. Before you go off the slide, I don't want to interrupt your presentation. What makes that picture is not go back to the Oh, yes, vehicle. yeah, the picture's What makes important. it very poignant. You may ask yourself, so what is that little what, what tech, is, tech Dutch just get it building? Just it back up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is this is rooted for train station. <laughs> was, yeah? Yeah. Was, 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 was. This this was a bustling hub of activity for decades and decades. A beautiful old building, right? Uh, that uh, tragically was involved in a fire, and despite billions and billions of rands in a trust capital program, nobody's done anything about it. So. Um, <laughs> This is sort of emblematic of the decline, right? You've got the railways on the decline in the back, and the paratrons all parked up out front to pick up all the passengers who used to go into the train station. Um, okay, next slide, thank you. So, how does this business work? This is, this is important, and it's a point I've made now, but it's important to understand how this business works. In South Africa, at least, it's very organized. It's, it's quite well structured, right? This is a legacy of so the policy and regulatory efforts that have been put in place over the years. Uh, you have owners. Uh, owners typically are not the same as drivers, although there are a few exceptions. Uh, one owner may have many vehicles, uh, or they may just have one, so there's a range of ownership. Owners, by law, are required to be members of associations, which are root-based associations. And those root-based associations then affiliate to, generally, it's the national uh, association that then does the uh, um, interfacing with government. Um, these associations, they negotiate with the neighboring associations around what the tariffs are going to be. They set the tariffs. Government has got no influence on tariffs. Um, so yeah, taxi associations are groups of individual owners associated to each other by virtue of operating the same route. To be a new entrant, you must register. It's a requirement when you apply for an operating license that you go with a letter from the association saying that they will accept you into the route. Now that letter costs a lot of money, <laughs> right? You don't get that letter for nothing. <laughs> so there's a massive upfront investment and depending upon the how lucrative the route is the association decides well actually you know we don't like your face we're going to charge you a lot of money for this you know or some associations they just stop taking new members um each owner runs his own business and competes internal right with these other association members for passengers um drivers manage cash which is a very really important uh, business practice because the driver manages the cash and uh, pays for fuel, the vehicle owner has got no clue what's going on in his business, right? He gets his 500 or 600 rand a day, right? And that's all he knows. And that's all he cares about. 
He doesn't know what it costs to run the vehicle. He doesn't know how much money the vehicle's taking, and he's not interested either by the way. But also it means that drivers, they race to get the target. Because once I've gotten my daily target, then after that, right, everything's mine. So now that means that I work 14, 15 hours days, right? Uh, if it's not a good day for me, I'm fatigued. I don't take breaks because I need to make money, right? Um, and I speed, I drive recklessly because I need to get in front of this guy so I can pick that passenger up. That one fact underpins a lot of the ills of this place. Uh, uh, owners pay for the vehicle. They pay for some major consumables, tires, brake pads, these kinds of things. Uh, they pay for maintenance, in theory. Um, the drivers pay for fueling and cleaning the vehicle. <laughs> now, the industry, if you look at it from a bus operations point of view, I have to say that, right? Uh, from a bus operations point of view, this is a very deeply inefficient way to run a public transport service. Um, the routes are heavily <laughs> oversupplied. In many instances, you can take half of those vans off and still meet the demand adequately, right? The competition I've mentioned, how that works to uh, oversupply during peak periods when everybody's racing to pick up passengers and undersupply during off-peak periods when there's nobody and everybody stands around waiting for a bus for 40, 50 minutes. The size of the vehicle is completely unsuitable for the route. In many instances, the one, the, the route that we're going to be presenting is 50 kilometer route, 100 kilometer return journey, right? And you're running that with 16 seated buses. I mean, it's, it's crazy, right? But there's a reason why this industry has settled on this one vehicle modality. Nico, I'm hoping you're going to go into that. Um, but that drives a massive, massive fleet requirement, right? Which is why we have a quarter of a million of these vehicles running. Oh my God, really? <laughs> uh, bad. bad driver behavior, uh, I mentioned that, high levels of dead, unproductive mileage, uh, drivers taking vehicles home, uh, oftentimes like 15-20% uh, of the ops cost is just the guy driving the vehicle home at the start of the route, right? And then you've got these small businesses, everybody fighting for their own slice of the cake, uh, they've got no bargaining power. Okay, next slide. Sure, I'm going to run over quite a bit. Um, owners have limited access to financing. There's no financing options, so extremely limited and costly. Owners have poor credit, uh, no collateral. This makes their businesses also extremely unstable. You have a high level of uh, possessions, any kind of personal financial shock, and they're coming for your van, they're taking it in your business instead. Uh, high financing costs limits the vehicle choice. Basically, this is all you can afford. This is all that's available in the market. That's all you take. Individual owners can't scale, they can't access sort of the typical uh, lucrative contracts that are out there for staff, transport, they can't consider innovation. The industry is stuck. Um, next slide. Thanks. Conditions are bad for passengers and drivers. I've mentioned drivers working long hours. Uh, passengers are forced into these overcrowded vehicles. Uh, there's long waiting times, poor trip time predictability. Uh, the other aspect of this is that because the driver tries to fill the vehicle at the rank, the vehicle leaves the rank full, which means that if you want to get a seat in the vehicle, you have to go to the rank. You can't stand on the side of the road. So that means you have to take an additional journey, which adds to your journey cost. Safety is a challenge, and we've all heard the horrible stories about gender-based violence. Uh, the way government is engaging with the sector has changed dramatically. And so initially, they were largely ignored. Then there was a need to bring in some regulation. That regulation was eventually enforced with a heavy hand. Uh, then there was a program to recapitalize the sector through the TRP. The BRTs came along and the idea was going to just get rid of everybody. We will replace them. And now finally, we're looking at reforming them. Thank you. Um, and so there's a shift. Cities are now beginning to look to the minibus taxi mode to play a much more central role in their transport plans. This is an active movement. Uh, minibus taxi certainly has feeders to trunk buses. Uh, direct contracts with taxi associations are starting to be discussed. 
But the problem is, cities can't interface with the industry because who am I talking, which of the 10,000 of you am I actually going to contract with? The taxi industry needs to organize to take advantage of this. Thank you. Um, there's also a realization that they're going to be around for a very long time. Well, probably forever. Uh, BRT is going to take forever to roll out. Um, and even when you complete the BRT service, right, uh, which could take 10 or 12 years, what about the rest of the city that doesn't have that one BRT route? What about the secondary cities? There are many places where you can't actually bring in BRT. What are you going to do there? You can't just ignore them. Um, so, you know, there's this, there's this movement to change things. Thank you. Um, reforming the taxi sector must be persuasively for the benefit of the taxi sector. This is, I mean, we keep talking about passenger benefits, and these are very important, but you're going to get nowhere if it's not persuasively beneficial for the owners of the vehicles. And that way you can address violence, safety, working conditions, coverage, reliability, but you can't do any of that if you don't address their needs for your program. Thank you. Uh, the COVID crisis showed us that the fragmentation in the industry limits the state's ability to intervene in case cases of emergency. Uh, the industry fell apart in South Africa during the lockdown, was deeply impacted, rebounded very quickly, but was deeply impacted. There was efforts to try and distribute grants, which didn't really go anywhere because of the fragmentation in the sector. Um, but through that process, there was a recognition, formal recognition, this is an industry that needs to formalize and government stands around that formalization. This is where our project comes from. We have a RAS in the DBS and the World Bank. We launched, I've said 2021, but uh, disputed. So um, uh, our approach has been very much learning by doing. Right? We've been working directly with taxi owners uh, to bring about our reforms. Thank you. The approach, Nico will go through this, but essentially we start by analyzing the business from a business perspective. We help them develop new business plans and then we test those business plans. And that's what we're doing in a nutshell. Nico will go into some of the details there. Thank you. Well, we've had uh, our noses put out of joint more than once. Um, <laughs> we have engaged with seven associations around the country, uh, four in Gauteng, that's around Johannesburg, two in the Western Cape. We even spoke to one in Pumalanga. Um, you know, you, you start talking, you make really good progress, invest a lot of money, and then uh, there's internal politics that you were not aware of that prohibits you from moving any further. Uh, we found that some associations said, one gentleman, I'll never forget, we met with them. They showed up in this hotel room. I'm away. They showed up in this hotel room. And the man said, this is fascinating. It's very important, but it's not urgent. <laughs> Uh, but anyways, we've got one association now that we've done great work with. Nico will come the details. Um, essentially, what we're doing, like I said, is we're converting these association memberships into shareholdings. Um, so we're transferring control of the vehicles and ownership of the vehicles from, from these members into the company, uh, rationalizing the fleet, uh, and, and in this way, we're promoting this positive cycle. Thank you. Um, I just want to point this out, maybe I should finish here, but it's very important for us to recognize this. This is what we found all through all seven associations that we've looked at with all kinds of different contexts. There is enough money in this industry from what we've seen so far to sustain reforms on commercial terms, which is you know, it, it's quite a big statement, and for me, it took a long time to internalize that. I just want to give two examples of associations. Association A, we won't mention names. 3,000 vehicles in this association, 2,000 members. They have a revenue annually of $47 million in aggregate. Uh, association B, 500 vehicles, 200 members. They're pulling in almost $10 million a year in revenue, right? Oftentimes, they profit margins of 20%. Right. There's enough money here if you pool everything together to do significant reform. 
this, right? But these guys making $47 million a year, they can't get an overdraft at the bank. So, you know, I mean, they, they can't get access to the most basic financials because they're not organized. You know, uh, that is, that's the thing that we're trying to address. Sorry, I think I'll leave it there. Um, I've gone well over my time. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Edward, and sorry for uh, rushing you a bit and the garden of time. Um, I would like now to invite uh, Nico McLachlan to um, take the floor. Um, Nico is the Managing Director of uh, Organization Development Africa, a Cape Town-based consultancy, um, and works for the World Bank team as a consultant. Um, he was instrumental in integrating minibus taxi operators in the Johannesburg and Cape Town BRT systems um, and has worked on various urban mobility uh, improvement projects across the African continent. Nico, over to you. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon. Thanks, uh, Simon, for that introduction. And Eddie, well done on the, the, the complex task of setting the background. Uh, always challenging to, uh, to limit oneself when you need to create context. Um, if you allow me, I'm going to preface my, my discussion so you can just hover on that slide for a moment, Corey, just by making three quick comments up front. And it's important I've learned over the years. Uh, I've spent 25 years at taxi ranks and meeting taxi bosses in shipping container. That's what I do. Uh, I've been around about 14 African countries. And uh, the other part of our discussion this morning for me is also to extrapolate. So how much of the South African experience is relevant to sub-Saharan Africa and vice versa? What can South Africa learn from other sub-Saharan countries? Um, let me just share three quick thoughts with you up front. And it's important that what's implicit in my mind when we do these projects, uh, Eddie, um, uh, Nanga, Cyprian, the team who we've been working with, um, that I share with you what my points of departure are. The first thing for me is understand in your city what is the paratransit sector or industry actually doing right now okay and why do i say that because of the issue of what i call the convenience of the feeder distributor paradigm sam zimmerman knows what i'm talking about okay we love to package the paratransit as oh they provide feeder distributor services well think again and to our data colleagues from this morning's discussion when you do the, your data collection, there was a call for better understanding, richer data, et cetera. The most important piece of data that we have worked with and that has helped us an enormous amount in this project is route typology. If you understand what the paratransit is doing and you want to intervene in improving it, please do yourself a favor to actually understand route typology. Who's doing what in your system? They do not only provide short trip feeder distributor services. On the contrary, at 83% of moving captive market audience, you're doing an enormous amount more than that. So the convenience of uh, the feeder distributor paradigm, planners love that because it's easy to say, we'll do this and this, and then the paratransit will provide a feeder service. Not the reality. The second point, Jackie Klopp will enjoy me saying this, make sure that you understand the political economy of your local paratransit industry. What drives it? How does it grow? Why do you have conditions of oversupply? What feeds that? So in our case, we have a very good understanding of that. This is about job creation. This is about how you enter the urban economy. If you're a rural boy who grew up in the Eastern Cape, you come down to Cape Town, your uncle has already got a fleet of four vehicles, you become a driver and within a year, we organize through the association a vehicle for you. And then, only then do we start trying to get your vehicle legalized. Same story around the continent. So understand the political economy. What are the driving forces behind the industry in your city? And then third, thirdly, linked to that, understand the inherent organization model of the industry. And that differs from country to country and even, in our case, city to city. But understand the inherent organizational model because there's an enormous amount of benefit in working with the inherent organizational logic. Finally, understand based on that, the response, the intuitive response of the paratransit industry to either the lack of, of or the dysfunctionality 
of the regulatory system. Because don't think that this is a cowboy industry. Yes, in part it is, but it actually has an enormous amount of self-regulation built into it. And Amanda, hopefully later, when she joins the discussion, will talk about this in the Kampala case, how the authorities often miss and misread the inherent organization and approach to supply and demand regulation that is inherent to the, to the industry. Okay, when we get to now, we, in a moment, we're gonna flip to that first slide, but I just need to say this. Edward spoke in, about big issues in big numbers. I'm gonna speak about a small thing in small numbers. So I'm going to speak in South African Rand, not in US dollars, because quite frankly, it just distresses me to convert. It's 1840 if you want to convert, 18 <laughs> rounds 40, okay. But at the taxi industry level, my numbers are rand level. So I know you say convert for the audience, but they can convert themselves. Okay. <laughs> Secondly, I'm going to speak in kilometers, not miles. If you want to do the conversion, one kilometer is 0 0.0621 mile. Okay. And then I'm going to speak in liters, not gallons. Okay. So a liter, uh, one liter is a point, point zero two six uh, US uh, liquid gallon. Um, and then finally, I'm going to speak about petrol and not gas. Is that okay? <laughs> All right, Corey, let's go to the slide that talks about the purpose of this presentation. So <clears throat> some of you in the room would no doubt have, have heard, and I know, Sam, at the time that, that you and Ajak did the, the MIFS presentation, Gershwin did a presentation on the 7th Avenue case. I was the, the project lead on the 7th Avenue case. I'm not going to dwell on that. But it is, it does represent a very important reference point in the South African experimentation with minibus taxi improvement and in integration. So from Edward's presentation, we've been, I would say, in the last five, six years, quite accentuated. But in fact, in the case of the city of Cape Town, since 2015, already dabbling with, well, what can we do differently to just a conventional BRT implementation? So at the moment, there's about six sort of relatively high profile so-called innovative models around minibus taxi improvement in South Africa. Uh, the Western Cape government, uh, has their Blue Dot program, uh, city of uh, uh, Durban has got Moja Cruise, the Khao Train, high speed um, uh, rail service has actually done a very interesting contracting model uh, to feed the, 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 the train. Uh, a feeder distributor service model, etc. These things are being evaluated at the moment because quite a number of them rely in some form or another on incentive schemes, which is not necessarily the way to go. Others, like the 7th Avenue model and the Hull Train model, rely on operations improvement and contracting as mechanisms of change, which is quite important. All right, so I'm going to touch on 7th Avenue just very, very briefly. I'm going to introduce the TTSA project on the Marabastad Randburg route, and I'll explain where that is to the west of Pretoria, running through to the west of Johannesburg. We'll inform you of what we found when we engaged this association at the what we call the as ease assessment phase. Uh, what did we decide to do? Talk to you about that. And then we'll tell you a little bit about what we've achieved. Um, but this is going to be a little bit, Simon, of a how to discussion. And when you tempted to show me five minutes, give me another five at that point. Okay, no, I'm joking. Um, so, where are we now? And then, hopefully, in the, the later discussion, we can talk about the potential of this work. And I'm sure some of you may look at this and say, is that the right way to go? Aren't we commercializing? Aren't we formalizing something that should be left in its current state, etc.? So, Briefly on 7th Avenue, if we can go to the next slide. Um, and the issue of typology is very important here for me, from the 7th Avenue learnings to the PRS Marabastad um, operation. So 7th Avenue in Mitchell's Plain, about 30 kilometers to the metro southeast of Cape Town, a typical feeder distributor operation, a circular route of just under seven kilometers, operated at the time by a fleet of about 80 ta taxis, 78 taxis. The main shift we introduced there on that feeder distributor, this feeds into a major public transport interchange in the center of Mitchell's Plain, where bus, rail, BRT, and, uh, and minibus taxi line haul services come together. So the main shift we, we focused on there was a shift from unscheduled to scheduled operation. And just in focusing on that singular thing, in a feeder distributor environment, those were the results. We reduced the fleet size 
from 80 taxis down to 40 taxis. I think 38 plus two in spare or 37 plus three in spare, something like that. In doing that, we reduce the fuel consumption, no, not carbon footprint, <laughs> the fuel consumption by 45%. And we could measure that because they had their own little makeshift depot. So that was very, very accurately tracked and measured. We increased the number of routes. So the coverage in that residential areas from three to five routes um, against the backdrop of reducing the fleet size. Um, and then of course, we, we decreased the, the driver working hours from an average of 15 to 7.5. And very important, and I know there's some of my colleagues like Dave Spooner on the call from GLI, we also moved the drivers into what one could define as um, decent working conditions. So compliant with, in our case, the Basic Conditions of Employment Act working conditions. Significant improvement in passenger satisfaction. Um, we did an extensive before and after passenger satisfaction survey over a seven day period covering more than 700 passengers and the, the results were absolutely astounding. That was Seventh Avenue. It wrapped up in 2019. The association ran with that business improvement model on their own completely for 12 months. And then the city of Cape Town didn't come to the party in terms of assistance with fleet recapitalization and COVID hit. So unfortunately, that experiment has fizzled out. If you go there with me now, there's remnants of it. So under conditions of depressed demand, they are still in fact reverting back to the scheduled service because it's equitable in terms of the, the association. All right, that's the Seventh Avenue story, feeder distributor environment. Let's move to the next slide. So what you're looking at now, you can actually go to the picture slide just following us this. We, we then, through trial and error, and through Nanga, who features on the picture on the right-hand side there, and Supreme, by the way, you're on the left-hand side there, um, we actually discovered um, these seven associations across the country where we went knocking on the door, trying to create markets, so to speak. We discovered the Pretoria, Randburg, Shoshangue Association, PRS for short. Shoshangue is a settlement built in the apartheid years, about 40 kilometers to the north of Pretoria. So people who use this service, in fact, for many of them, their trip in the morning originates 40 kilometers to the north of Pretoria. Then they get to this place called Marabastak, which is a very basic uh, transfer facility, tax facility. This association, that picture tells a story in its own right. That picture is taken in the training room um, of, of this association. They acquired over the last couple of years a residential property on the western side of Pretoria, where the property market is a little bit depressed, acquired a residential property and converted it into an office complex, fully kitted out with its own training facility. And if you just step outside that, that building, you'll see a couple of branded vehicles that belong to the association that they use for um, monitoring their operations in the field. It's a much bigger association than the part we're working with here. They have about a fleet of 3,300 uh, taxis, and they cover a massive footprint. So we only focusing on one route association in the association at the moment, of course, with the intent to expand, and Supreme will, will speak about that. So what do you see? You see an association that's already experimented with the benefits of pooling resources. This is a great starting point if you're contemplating moving people into a different form of being and operating. Okay, next slide, please, Corey. Okay, so to give you a little bit of a, a, a view on them, a line hall association, they operate a 54 kilometer trip distance between a place called Marabastak on the west of Pretoria and a place called Randburg that has <coughs> a fairly modern taxi rink on the western side of Johannesburg. So 108 kilometer return trip, sorry about the miles, I'm not doing the conversion there. What we found, and this is great for the data people to hear. And for me, as a change management specialist, a fantastic thing to pick up. This association, in fact, um, employs a QR code um, based um, passenger uh, monitoring system. So what happens at the rank in the morning when uh, the vehicle loads full, the rank marshal takes a, a screenshot of the, uh, of the QR code and that gets WhatsApp through to the owner. So the owner has an idea of the load factor for the day. And you'll see in a moment what we got when we started working with them roughly in June last year is 186 days of data for the preceding three months, uh, which is fantastic to have that kind of 
um, uh, passenger demand data right on tap. Okay, so what is this telling us about the industry and technology? It's actually saying when technology makes commercial sense to this industry, it adopts it. Okay, and we'll get to fair, to fair systems in a moment. Okay, during that period, to give you a sense, this relatively small operation operated 10,500 trips over that three month period, and they're operating a relatively small 29 vehicle uh, fleet, which is, and this is very important, it's a mixed. 15 seater passengers and 22 seater fleet. And this is quite a central theme in the operations and business model improvement process. Running on a mixed petrol and diesel um, uh, 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 en engine configuration. So nine diesel vehicles and 20 petrol vehicles. The significance of that I'll illustrate in a moment. But let's go to the next slide. So what did we find? Okay, and then we can go to the next slide. So there's the story, 186 days of data, the day we started working with these guys. What you're looking at on the left-hand side is the um, monthly fare revenue generated. The blue on the left are the 15-seater vehicles. Tells a fascinating story about limited vehicle capacity. And on the, on the right-hand side, you see the green bars um, is the, the passenger revenue generated over that three-month period by the 22-seater vehicles. If we throw out the two or three outliers on the right hand side, and we and at the bottom, by the way, what you see are the individual registration numbers of. So data is critically important for us. You, you cannot do a business improvement if you don't know what's actually going on in the in the current state in the business. Okay. So if we go to the next slide, Corey, it actually tells the story of this slide. Um, and there we go. So when you look at the over that three month period. I need 10 more, 10 more, come on. You can't fly me here 15 hours and then give me five minutes. <laughs> yes. Essential. Yes. Okay. So, far. so if you look at that, that picture there, the, the average monthly kilometers, do the drop down, just go through that. On the left hand side, your 15 seater vehicle. On the right hand side, the 20 seater vehicle. All the figures, very interesting. Right at the bottom, the owner of a 22 seater makes double the monthly return on these vehicle than the owner of a 15-seater vehicle. By the way, the driver of the 15-seater earns double what the driver of the 15-seater, okay? So what am I doing? I'm building up from the as-is assessment of this business. I'm building up to the improvement case, okay? Corey, we need to run. Simon is gonna kick me out here. So <laughs> we, we get to the next picture, and this is the other interesting thing. There's been a lot of discussion here about uh, EV this week. And we're all very excited about that, but this is our reality at the moment. If only we can move that fleet of 29 vehicles to the middle bar, where only the nine diesel vehicles, if we could negotiate a three run per liter discount at the pump, that's the saving that we'll get, half a million rand saving. If we can move the current fleet with the, with the inappropriate fleet mix of 15 and 22 seaters, all to diesel will save a million rand on diesel per annum. And when, once we understood this, this gave us the other part of our improvement strategy in the immediate term. All right. So, Corey, let's keep, let's keep running through these slides. Very important for us to look at those other two vehicle types I'm talking about. On the left-hand side, the ubiquitous 90% on, on the road in South Africa, Toyota Quantum, manufactured or assembled at the Toyota plant in Durban in South Africa, that's been the case for 50 years, um, dominant supplier in the market. And then on the right hand side, that's a Mercedes Sprinter, it's a 22 seater. We have about three of these types of vehicle from different suppliers and I'll get to a slide on that in a moment and we'll actually um, bring in EVs into the discussion. Sam and I wink wink at each other about the EV thing. You'll get a comment on that in a moment. Look at the age, average age of those vehicles in this specific, specific association, and then look at the average mileage. So you're very close to half a, half a, half a million kilometers um, after six years on that small 15-seater vehicle, doing that trip distance. That's why route typology data, guys, is so important because it has a massive impact on efficiencies of operation. All right, Cody, we move to the next slide. So based on these findings, and of course, there's a lot more that we found, but these are the key findings. What did we decide to do? 
all right, let's tell them what we decided to do. We decided to focus on efficiency gains to be derived from economies of scale, collectivization. People get hung up about corporatization. It's an outflow of a decision to collectivize, to pool, resource, revenue, fleet. And that's the emotive decision is not about corporatization. Shall we form a company? No, let's have the conversation of shall we pool our resources? It's the anti-natural contract that you're talking about there, okay? We focus on efficiency gains to be derived from establishing appropriate fleet mix. No rocket science here in South Africa. The law defines what a mini and a midi bus is. And it defines a midi bus as a bus with 35 seat, seat capacity. We have very few of those vehicles in the market. So what you'll find, you'll find the standard mini bus, 15 seat, and you'll find some 22 seater vehicles, specifically in terms of intercity services. So operators who provide both local and intercity services tend to mix their fleet to, to go to 22 seaters. So in this case, to make it simple, in terms of what is available in the market and what is known to the industry, the most difficult thing you can do to a paratransit owner is to talk to him about a vehicle he doesn't know. He'll stick to the vehicle he knows and the vehicle he can repair and the vehicle he can maintain. So our strategy here was to standardize on higher occupancy vehicles, in this case being defined as 22 c vehicles. Efficiency gains to be derived from standardizing on uh, the fleet that runs on diesel fuel. Okay, sorry to say that, but that's our reality. And we'll talk in a moment about EVs and just how out of reach EV is for us at the moment, okay. Why? Because diesel, the price of diesel in South Africa is not regulated. The price of petrol is. Fascinating anomaly, it works in our favor. We can go and bulk buy and negotiate two, three round discounts because we're bulk buying from one supplier, one filling station in essence, to make it very simple. Efficiency gains to be derived from critically, and this is where my colleagues to the right <laughs> come in, and where's, uh, where's our finance man? Is he in the room? Efficiency gains to be derived from reducing the cost of capital. And we'll talk about that maybe in detail in the question and answer session. Average cost of capital in South Africa for a taxi owner who, who recapitalizes a vehicle, in addition to the mon monopolistic supply of vehicles from Toyota South Africa, you have effectively, in my view, Supreme, you'll correct me afterwards, uh, a monopolistic model around vehicle financing and an exploitative model in my view, because the, the uh, atomized nature of the industry is used by the financing sector as the reason to drive up the cost of capital. So on average, not strange to find between 23 and 33 percent um, interest rates being charged um, over a period of 72 months to, to recapitalize the vehicle. It's a shocking figure, but I know. All right, so now you can understand why the BBSA comes into the picture. I told Edward from the beginning to say, we need to drive down the cost of capital. Cost of capital, the proverbial straw that breaks the camel's back. And by the way, I think there's a lot of uh, parallels with this in, in the rest of Sub-Saharan Africa. All right, so, and then finally, improved, uh, uh, that's fine, that's okay, we can skip over it. But just to say, passenger infrastructure, and supporting infrastructure for the association. Dead mileage, Edward touched on that, I've got three minutes. All right, Simon, don't worry, I'm getting that's, to that. That's including the extra five. It's including the extra uh, I, I was doing five because I was converting miles in kilometers. <laughs> okay. All right, so what did, uh, um, what, what did we achieve? Let's go to that slide. So I'm, just, I'm going to run through these slides quite quickly now. You, you're now familiar with the fleet mix, 22-seaters and 15-seaters. When you go into a taxi association in South Africa, you're going to find a mix on top of that of vehicles that are encumbered, where people owe the bank, um, or vehicles that are unencumbered, um, freehold vehicles. And that's very important to understand. You can see the moment an owner has an encumbered vehicle, he's actually running negative every month. Okay, now you're going to say, but how on earth do they do that? How do they service the debt? You only get to that situation because you actually have vehicle number two or vehicle number three, of which you leverage to pay the bank for vehicle number number four, whatever the case may be. Okay, and that's very important to understand because here, in terms of business transformation, we're talking about moving owners, drivers, and staff over a line. 
you've got to move people from five minutes to midnight to five minutes after midnight. If you don't understand the brass tax issues here, you'll get nowhere. And you need to have that figure and you need to sit with them and say, this is your current reality. Do you agree? And they look at it and they say, yes, it is our reality. Right. So, Kauri, if we then go to the next slide. With the business model we've developed over the next 10 years and for which we are now knocking on the door of the Development Bank of Southern Africa for financing to help us drive down the cost of capital, we turn all of those figures into positives. Why? Because we are liberating the individual owner of the cost of capital and it becomes a corporate issue in the business. Let's go to the next slide. All right. How will this affect drivers? I'm going to run through this very quickly. We've settled driver pay at 32 rand an hour. The Basic Conditions of Employment Act for informal work um, recommends 23 rand 19 cents per hour. So we are way above that. Driver conditions of service will include access to a provident fund, a 13th check, uh, provisions for annual leave and sick leave, and all statutory deductions on employment insurance work into their total cost of employment package. I know Dave Spooner at GLI is going to smile broadly when he sees this. All right. And then all drivers will work in accordance with the basic schedule. So we do introduce a shift, a, a shift system with an operating schedule, but it is not the hard thrust that we used in 7th Avenue because of the trip distance. And by the way, these guys are already quite demand responses. It's only a tweaking of their schedule that's required, but doing that, we then move drivers again, like in the 7th Avenue case, onto a 7.5 hour workday with a 30 minute break and one day off in a typical seven day operating cycle, just like a bus driver would do. All right, Cody, we're almost there. So how did we achieve this? How did we achieve all of this? Okay, Simon, I'm going to turn a blind eye to your, your cards for, for the moment. Okay. Um, by effectively focusing on those things, improve the revenue to cost ratio of the vehicle in the fleet by standardizing on diesel 22 seaters. That's, that's been a big that combination of those two. Go for the HOV within the legal definition, standardize on diesel fuel because you're going to can negotiate a discount. Reduce the cost of capital. And you'll see in the model, which I'll share in a moment, not the model, but the, the, that element of the model, it's a substantive reduction in cost of capital that's required to make these businesses viable. And that's the Cyprian's discussion yeah. at the moment. Reduce the cost of fuel, optimize operations. And there you can see it's a light touch optimizing operation. So we're just evolving the operating model. We're not coming in with a radical change to the operating model. And then very, very important. And this again goes to where a DFI, the DFIs come into the picture. Attend to overnight staging and centralization of fueling and maintenance. We need well-appointed overnight staging areas in the paratransit industry. We need to cut on dead mileage. The vehicle can't go home another 20 kilometers with the driver tonight and do another 20 kilometers dead mileage in the morning. Come on, how do we want to make this industry competitive and provide a good quality service? Okay, Cody, um, Simon, I'm at my last two or three slides. Of course, very important. You need to get me to the next slide. There we go. Training and Mustafa, institutional capacity building, part and parcel of, of the program. Skills audit. The first thing we, well, in fact, we started doing that last week is all the execs, the office bearers, all the, all the drivers, all the staff involved in this operation. We do a skills audit because you find absolutely gems. There's diamonds in there. Somebody worked at some point in a financial institution, but, you know, so we just find these things out and you've developed that skills understanding. And all of a sudden, when we now need to populate Nangata's upper new operating structure, we actually have people at the recognition of prior learning and experience, people who we didn't know in the association actually know how to read a balance sheet. Well, we need you because we're now professionalizing the accounting system. Okay. Um, Sophistication of internal organizational arrangement. And again, what you're going to find in most paratransit operations, in my experience, is there is a nascent form of organization. Don't throw it out, just sophisticate it. And that's what we're doing here. And then in terms of actual skills training, Mustafa, corporate governance. I now have, we've created a company that's registered with us, uh, the Intellectual Properties and Companies uh, Commission in South Africa. People have become directors, elected at a special general meeting of shareholders 
What does it mean to be a director? So governance training, management training, finance and admin, operations training. We saw the, the program this morning and then driver training, of course. We need the drivers to learn how to behave in a different way. And by the way, we're preparing them to move from cash to cashless. All right, I need to wind up. So with the next slide, we can skip business plan parameters. If you were to analyze the business plan, what would you look at? This slide I thought is important because uh, there's been so much talk in the last two days about EV. So our choice about vehicle um, to standardize on with the recap program is very important. And I am going to run through this in a minute, Simon. Okay, so yeah. starting on the left, you've got one, two, three, four, um, 22 seated vehicles where we've done a TCO, a total cost of ownership comparison between them. In the middle, you'll see the Yutong. It's a 24 seat vehicle, 25 plus driver. Not really um, suitable, but look at the cost, the total cost there. And then on the right hand side, right of the of the of the big pillar in the middle, you have one, two, three, four, 15 seater vehicles. The the standard Toyota Quantum just to the right of the Yutong, and then three electric options that we've uh, uh, um, gone through based on a parallel um, project that uh, Edward has commissioned with uh, Transit Tech in the University of Stellenbosch. So you can see there, so th those, uh, the, the first one is a, um, an import, um, third from the right. The second one is a, uh, a retrofit where we literally rip out the, uh, the diesel engine and retrofit it to become a 15-seater EV. And then the other one is a bolt to scale option uh, if we were to go there in South Africa. This is all un undiscounted. Undiscounted. It's not net present value, not present it, value. It, it's yes. Just yes. adding up the costs. That's right. That's right. It, there's, there's no dis discounts involved here. That's right. Okay. So just to show you, we are going to go for the, uh, the Mercedes Benz, which is the one on the far left. Because the, the wonderful one over there, the VW, just left of the Yutong, the long one, there's only a few demo models available in South Africa. But ideally, uh, the chairman of the association said, why aren't we going for the, the Yutong? Okay, I am going to stop, but only if I can show the last two slides. <laughs> so the next slide is important, and I won't dwell on this, but what were the business rules? And we can come back to this in the Q&A. What were the business rules that we applied to help us govern this transition from association to transport operating company? There they are, and these are maybe quite unique to the South African situation, given our state of regulation, etc. The fact that I have an operating license that has a net, net present value, it has a five to seven year life, not like in most of the African countries that I've worked in, the operating license has a one year lifespan. Se severely undermines value, etc. So those are the rules. But now, when we look at the numbers, let's end up with the numbers, Corey. There's been two slides on numbers, and Cyprian, that sets you up beautifully to talk about. Okay. So, sorry, just just that slide. Just go back to that slide. One up. Thanks. So a week ago, this association, through the company we've created for them, they created for themselves, actually submitted a financing application to the Development Bank of South Africa based on a 10-year business plan that shows their viability. And that application is in essence for uh, assistance with fleet recapitalization at a more uh, affordable cost of, of capital. So let's skip the risks. I know people love risk. I don't love risk, okay? <laughs> and we go to the final two slides. So for the bankers in the room and the finance people in the room, up. So again, it doesn't add up. Yeah. <laughs> so for, for the bankers in the room, have a look at that. Okay. So profitability ratio hovering around 30% over the 10 year model. And it's only in terms of the asset test ratio and the debt ratio because of the cost of capital in the beginning that those ratios run negatively in the first four years. After that, you start seeing the positives coming through. And the very final slide, sorry, is. Um, so this business plan under consideration by some committee in the bank at the moment <laughs> is actually looking at a, a model that, that gives you those kind of rates of return, okay? So Edward's closing point, my closing point, <clears throat> the industry can be commercially viable on current fair revenues if you invest in the right things in assisting them 
and if you do the right improvements. And I think this is the story. Okay. So thanks very much for your indulgence, Monsieur Salier. I really appreciate that. And uh, thanks everybody for uh, sitting through this. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, you up. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Nico. So uh, now we're going to hear from uh, Cyprian Maroa, who is the head of infrastructure finance coverage, transport and logistics uh, division at the Development Bank of Southern Africa, that's uh, DBSA. He has over 20 years experience in corporate investment banking and infrastructure project finance investments at DBSA and uh, other global banks. So Cyprian, can you uh, give us a financier's perspective on how this pilot might unlock new perspective for um, the paratransit industry in terms of uh, improved business viability and, and access to financing, as uh, Nico started to mention. Thank you very much. Uh, somebody forgot to tell Nico that profits don't pay loans. <laughs> <laughs> so I work for a government owned bank. That kind of leans towards um, uh, sort of free money in the form of uh, subsidies, right? Because it's a government bank. <laughs> so, and I want to get a point here. Uh, next slide, please. I'm very grateful to my colleagues. You can see from the amount of information that they've unpacked about this business. We would never have been able to do it as, as a bank. We simply don't have time for that. So the relationship here is working perfectly because the key to funding anything is removing information symmetry. As a banker, my rule is if I don't know much about you, I'll charge for worst case scenario. In fact, you're lucky if I give you any money. So you can see what's going on here. There is transparency around what is going on. Earlier on, you heard that the driver does not tell the owner how much he has made. The owner gets whatever they agree, that's it. So the driver does all sorts of things, including pulling out guns to shoot other drivers so that he gets that passage. We were not going to dabble in that as a bank. So these gentlemen, the World Bank and ODA, and my team, phenomenal work around this business, which is now allowing us to see through what's going on and put a proposal together. That's really my take home on this. So that's the initiative. Next slide. This is the bank that <coughs> exists exist in physical form. We were formed in 1983. And we're 100% owned by government. But we get zero cents from government to disperse. We run a private sector model. We go and borrow money to lend to others. We sit in between. We raise bonds. We borrow from other banks. Then we lend into projects. So there is no thinking or talking of subsidies. There is no free money. All the money belongs to other people who must pay it back. And that's very key to how we behave as a bank. Next slide, please. So you can see we borrow foreign currency because we lend in other countries in the region. And this is our rating. If we were not government owned, we would be rated better than government. But we are government owned, so we follow the sovereigns. <laughs> we have local rating. We also have accreditation. This is phenomenal. This allows us to access cheaper funds because we accreditation to global institutions around environmental matters and so forth. So we're doing well. And this is important to determine what price we get funds at. So if we get funds cheaper, it means somebody else at the end of the curve gets funds cheaper. No subsidies, because we have to pay back. Next slide, please. This is our geographical coverage and our sector coverage. Energy has had the show for a while now. We're down to transport now for the wrong reasons, emissions and so forth. And also in particularly in, in the region where we come from, transport takes people to work. It kickstarts economies. It's the center of economic activity. And when I talk transport, 
this age, this brother says, well, pots, harvest, hair pots, roads, and so forth. So the sector that we run <coughs> is transport, <coughs> and we cover all those investments. We've done investments in ports, investments in rail, we have train, and so forth. And it's really irresponsible of my bank not to look at this sector for the reasons you have heard. 70% of workers move using this. How can we look that way? So it's about how to unpack it. And that's what this is about. Next slide, please. We don't claim to do it alone. We have massive trust partners and muscle that we work with, but we must know what we're doing for our partners to join in looking at this. Can we imagine what would happen if this takes off? Nationally, regionally, the number of structures that have to be put in place. And then, importantly, we're creating an asset class here. And the insurance companies have knocked on, on our doors when we did this with other sectors to say, can we buy those assets off you? We're not going to fund this by ourselves. We may do the initial work, beg 10 of them, and maybe sell out the billions to. to those that are allowed to buy from us, because insurance companies will not be able to invest directly uh, in, into these uh, investments. So these are partners across both Africa and South Africa, and those we are rated well, to do things well, we've been able to join hands with them on a lot of projects. Next slide, please. Now, so why are we there? We were created for the simple purpose that we are not replacing budgetary allocations for projects for government. If government does that, then the very lucrative projects in the private sector, we, you, you won't even see it before the private bank picks it up. But there are marginal areas where it's very difficult for government to also fund that because they run out of budget. But private sector don't, don't quite like those investments because they are not very, very viable. Water is one good example. You, you very difficult to get private sector investments in water projects or education projects or even health projects. Similarly, we find that this project sits in space where private banks are not quite yeah. rushing in to solve the issue of public transport in our, in our country because they don't know what's going on and Frankly, they say, give us your house, then we'll give you money to buy a car. <laughs> right? That won't work for a lot of people because most of them don't have houses, or the houses are bonded and all. So it it's, it's really represents an area of market failure because banks are not rushing in to go in there. Is there no one in there? Of course there is. And you will see why they are there and why we think we should now come in and pull in others with us. So the key point is we are addressing a market failure. Even for us to take this in, we are to demonstrate within the committee that there is market failure in this space. There is market failure. Nobody, commercial banks, are not rushing in to fund these projects at that level. Again, an important point here is it's not about just the market failure. It's being risk tolerant and being able to mitigate the risks or perceived risk through information provision. And that's why these two gentlemen have come in and are unpacking what's going on. Next slide, please. Next slide. So we as a government bank look to government departments to look at what are their infrastructure programs. So in this case, we looked at Department of Transport. Then we realized there are 100 pieces of legislation to regulate just this one fuel industry. I mean, a taxi owner could, could hardly go through that and comply to them. So it's a difficult space. But we looked at it and said, okay, there's a problem. Importantly, we became aware that this is space we need to play a role and change some things. So that's how we motivated for a budget to bring in experts in certain areas, the World Bank and ODA, to say, please help us unpack this, because we realize the importance of, of this sector. Next slide, please. 
You have heard about the investments that happens with the BRTs. But we, we noticed that someone has been left out. <coughs> Next slide. This is what motivated us to look at it. Next slide, please. This was done for BRTs, passive investments. Next slide, please. Beautiful for BRTs. Next slide, please. Amazing. Go on. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> It's slow. Like, it's <laughs> they even had to tell the taxi driver, this is for a bus. Don't be there. <laughs> right? How do you think the industry feels, the taxi bus industry guys? They see this. Next slide, please. The long and short of it then. The taxi industry does the bulk of the work, right? Minibus takes 69%. They carry the most number of people, right? They do the most number of trips compared to all the other modes. Look at the subsidies that they get. In fact, when you say subsidy, I disagree with you. You know what the subsidy is? You bring your own taxi, we'll give you 60,000. You can't even buy a wheel with that kind of money. <laughs> So it's not a subsidy. It's so unfair that this, it has brought the minibus taxi industry together. And if you look at all the fights, it's with government about this disparity. I carry the most number of people. I do the most trips. You don't give me anything. In fact, you empower my competition. But they are still in existence today, the minibus taxis. They are resilient. We started thinking there must be something going on there because of this dynamic. So we said, let's look at who is in it from a financing perspective. And it's simply, it's just leasing finance. That's the funny bit. All the other commercial banks, you've got to submit something in your house for you to get funding to buy a car. The only person who seemed to be doing it was a lease house. So we said, let's unpack what they're doing. Next slide, please. Okay, these are the guys we're talking about. But next slide, please. <coughs> so we became, we made a decision that we, we must focus as a bank on this de facto mode of transport, the minibus takes, because of the numbers I showed you. And that we will see what levels of investments as a bank we can take part in, either at an operating level or the supporting to operations level, Nico spoke about it. Or the other any other investment sector. This will become clear, uh, you know, as we unpack not today but in the future. But at this stage, our focus is at the operating level. This is the vehicles that they need funding for, and because it's one route, you can't load other investment onto a single route because it will simply make the model not work. The next slide, please. So. We said, let's, this is a listed company, so we could pull out its financials and see what was going on. Financial A, they publicized that, look, our headline earnings are 30%, and they said a lot of stuff in their financials. I said, okay. Another the financial said, we looked at the ratios, here's what we found out. Just focus on interest rate client. This is a listing arrangement. 28%. Even the equity returns on South African stock market are below this. <laughs> equity, and this is debt, 28%. And the industry is still standing. This is a ripoff. Right? So we made a mistake. The initial proposal that our team did was to actually support one of these, to give them funding, cheap funding so that they go and charge this <laughs> to their clients. It became clear what was going on. When we do SMA funding, where there is a bit of market risk, and it's a worthy cause, 
<coughs> we are around 12, 15% on debt. In fact, it's about 15, 18% if it's equity. But these guys on lease, no wonder why that guy who has an encumbered vehicle is in the negative because it's all going to this guy, to the bank. So the money is there, but you have to get the numbers and the structures right. This is why we're here. This is why a DFI, a DBSA, is intervening to correct this wrong. It's nothing personal, it's business, but this is not right because these are people that are trying to make it in life. They don't, they don't understand financial models. They don't do financials. They just run taxis, they own the arrangement and they are in existence and they are everywhere. They are not going anywhere soon. And they are not even subsidies. So we assumed in our modeling that there is zero subsidies, but we must work around this. We use our best credibility to get decent money and deploy, but in a structured way. We are not going to give to individuals. Individuals, I, I think you picked this up that if all of us is, have one taxi and we go to bank, the bank will charge each one of us a transaction cost. But if we come together, guess how many? Only as a company, the transaction cost savings on being the operating <coughs> company are massive. So we are looking to efficiencies around the existing. And we couldn't do it as a bank because we could be biased. So we asked experts at it to say, put it together and see what we can come up with. But this is the reason why we got involved. Next slide, please. We have a portfolio of different products. We even can help you plan, prepare, our own finance, build, and we can follow through what is going on with you, with your business. But clearly, because it's the thousands of them, if they aggregate, and become companies, this is much easier to follow and deploy. This is the basis, the foundations of our bank. We help you plan, prepare the projects, which is what we did. There's a financial model. Oh, we actually received a proposal. I'm assessed at my bank by the disbursements that I made into projects. We have that now. We are looking at it. So, this fits perfectly with what we do. Next slide, please. And sets the foundation for what we are proposing, because the, this could really evolve into numerous things. It's called a program management office. Basically, it's a receiving court for all proposals of a similar nature, and a team that sits in there and basically sifts it through process so that is fast because if individually tax associations bring in to the mainstream bank, it has to compete with energy, health sectors. But this is dedicated to just the uh, uh, minibus taxi industry proposals. We've done this with energy, we've done it with education, we've done it with other sectors. So it can be done. And I think we're good at it as a bank because we realize our inadequacies and set up a team. So this would be need, need to be capacitated. And a typical structure, next slide please. Yeah. It, this cites the different aspects of the program management office. And an example is in, on the next page, it's for a different uh, structure. Next slide please. This is one that recently set up for building schools in South Africa. A dedicated team in the office. Some talk to the funders like us within the bank. It sits within the bank. So this setup is what would make this <coughs> not stop, but basically deploy fast. So a few thoughts, cutting shots. Um, I think we agreed we raised five twice, right? <laughs> <laughs> This is one of the, this is development impact. In South Africa, state-owned enterprises like ourselves, 
are not judged by profitability. We are not required to make profit. We must show development impact. The same for ESCOM. ESCOM is not, should not be famous for profit, but for providing power. Of course, they are failing. Sunrise is the same, both, <laughs> and so forth. So similar with us. On a parting show, last I just want to say, this operating model of us, each one owning a tax, does not work. And we won't fund this if it carries on. We need that to change, right? Because there are efficiencies to be gained from us operating as a company, or per root, or whatever. Not in, we can't fund individuals, right? So, and the association actually can't borrow. It needs rubbish. So, we are fixing that. We have received a proposal. We have a borrow of record that we know. And really, the trick in this is to removing information asymmetry. We want to know, we know that every day they get paid. Where does it go? What size is it? Where's got it? What does it look like? That's what we're doing. Pay each route. And that's how we're able to fund and capture the cash flow. We pays the loans, not the profit. And then there are other value chain opportunities. Along the route there, there may be real estate, there may be shops. At the station, there may be conversions of infrastructure that will generate businesses. We may put solar panels. So those are value chain opportunities that we also look at. Charging stations, so forth, around this, but around the operations. And then we think the case for program management it is worth it here. It's well, it will be approved because we, this is exactly what we've done before with other sectors like students accommodation and you saw building schools and so on. So from a banker's perspective, we are in because we provide us of information. And this is, this, will, this is a game changer for us in the sense that you can see the change that, 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 that is anticipated around the public transport uh, and remove the unfairness that's being you know, uh, experienced by minibus taxi operators if you compare with other other operators. Thank you. That's all. Thank you very much, Sifrint. Um, we're going to just change a little bit the running order and uh, invite uh, Tierno O from uh, the CEO of Citude um, to join us online uh, if he is connected. Yes, I see him over there. Um, just to introduce him, uh, so he's the, the director of the Executive Council for Sustainable Urban Transport in, in Dakar, um, which is currently uh, rolling, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the first 100% electric BRT on the continent. Uh, Tierno R is the doctor in transport economics um, and the president of the African Association of Urban Mobility Authorities. Um, Tierno, Dakar has a long history of paratransit professionalization, which was uh, anchored in a large fleet renewal program. Can you tell us how it relates to the approach uh, that's been adopted in SA and presented uh, through these different angles? The floor is yours, Tierno. Hello, everybody. I'm, I'm very uh, happy to be with you today. <laughs> And first of all, I want to, to thank all of you uh, and to thank SSATP uh, for the opportunity to give us to share some experience in, in, in Dakar. Um, the, the public transport sector in African uh, cities is characterized by the presence of artisanal modes of transport. Um, uh, the artisanal sector is generally fragmented, um, as we see uh, in the first presentation. Uh, in Dakar, operators own less than two vehicles. Um, it represents an important part of daily mobility service and uh, constitutes uh, an important provider of jobs. Uh, the services provided are flexible, adaptable, and uh, accessible. Uh, it is therefore necessary to professionalize uh, them because we have uh, lots of negative externalities. Uh, 
The project uh, presented by the speakers are very interesting and have some similarities, sorry, in Senegal. Indeed, in Senegal, we have Karapid and Jaganjai, which are paratransit mode of transport and absorb a significant share of uh, demand. A uh, reform was initiated in 1996 uh, in the transport sector and led to the creation of CTFUG, the local authority of transportation. One of the pillars of this reform was the professionalization of the DRT-Zonal <coughs> Um, we therefore began the renewal of it in 2005 with the support of uh, the support of World Bank and SSATP. Um, the objective to professionalize informal transport operators, build their capacities, and modernize operating uh, techniques. Uh, in Dakar, uh, the renewal of the public transport fleet by minibus is implemented through the Association of Financing of Urban Transport Professionals, AFTU, which brings together uh, 15 economic interest groups composed by about 2,000 operators. Um, so here you you can see some uh, similarities with the case of, uh, of South Africa. They operate the bus lines under a concession contract signed between CETWID and the Economic Interest Group. Uh, to support these operators, we set up facilities such as first the saving and credit mutual funds for the oper operators called Metrans which is in charge of mobilizing the capital contribution and providing financial support to, to operators. We also have uh, a social uh, mutual and a center provide operational assistance to, to operators. I also add the, that the state of Senegal has uh, set up a tax and custom exempt, exemption sorry, system with a local industry for vehicle assembly. Um, an innovative financial mechanism has been put in place. Indeed, the obsolete vehicles are withdrawn from circulation and a scrapping bonus is paid by the government to the owners. The new buses were given to the operators through a leasing system with contribution of uh, something like 10% uh, of price of the new vehicle and the rest is payable for for five years. Uh, approximately 2,500 vehicles have been renewed since uh, 2005. With the success uh, recorded in Dakar, uh, CETUD extend this program to other, other regions. Uh, it is also important to say that uh, uh, Dakar mobile system is undergoing uh, significantly with a uh, uh, huge transformation. Uh, we have right now running the, the BRT line, the first BRT line uh, that uh, will be 100% electric. And uh, we have also a regional express train uh, upon in December 2021. Uh, right now, we work also uh, in the restructuring of the public transport network, which will be operated uh, with local operators, uh, AFTU and Dakar Demdik. Uh, AFTU uh, were the association, the organization that we, uh, we, we, we lead uh, to shift from artisanal uh, to um, former. Uh, formal uh, sector. Um, also, we have 30% of uh, capital of the BRT operating company will be, uh, that believe will be owned by the local operators and a strong capacity building uh, program for that. Uh, this is some uh, key issues I, I share with uh, um, all our colleagues from uh, 
uh, Africa and from the world. Uh, and I would thanks again uh, SSATP for this uh, workshop, very important workshop. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tiano. We appreciate you joining online. We know it's late in Dakar. Uh, and that unfortunately you're not going to be able to stay with us for the rest of, uh, of the discussion, but it was very valuable to hear um, insights from, from West Africa. Um, now we're going to turn to the eastern side of the continent and invite another online presenter, uh, Amanda Ngabirano, to, uh, to take the floor and give, her, uh, give us um, her perspective. Um, Amanda Ngabirano is the chairperson of the National Physical Planning Board of Uganda, um, and she's also the independent chairperson of the Greater Kampala Paratransit Consultative Forum. Um, she is an urban and regional planner, a lecturer at Makarere University, um, and an advocate for uh, sustainable urban development and cycling. Um, Amanda, uh, having heard about the South African experience, how much of it do you think can be replicated in Kampala or would need to be um, adapted? And how much does it differ from uh, the path that you have taken or on which you are um, in Uganda? Over to you, Amanda. Uh, thank, thank you, Simone. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, as you can hear, there's some uh, noise on the road. Uh, it's, it's a messy time of the day, a lot of traffic. Yeah, and of course the taxis uh, are always blamed for being the uh, lead cause of uh, traffic congestion in the city. And we're always saying it could have been worse if the 14 passengers had a car each. So we are still blessed to have some uh, uh, minibus taxis with us. I think from uh, Edward's presentation, the, the, the thing that struck me was the issue of the business as usual. Uh, it's, it's exactly what's happening now here that the, the individual owners are having a lot of competition competition for routes, for stages, for passengers, and I think Nico took us through all that and, and called it an unhealthy competition. So we are experiencing a lot of that and uh, South Africa, to be honest, uh, specifically Cape Town, uh, since the tour of the MBTs and government, uh, like I mentioned yesterday, it has been like the yardstick, uh, but some people are still saying, is it really the one that we should benchmark? Is it really the one? Because you had this advantage of the FIFA, you had uh, uh, advantages of hosting uh, games and you know big stuff, which we have not yet gotten. And those things usually give a big push. It can be quickly done and a mistake is made, but it is something that we have not yet um, uh, had. And um, also the aspect of the size of the vehicle doing 50 kilometers, 70 kilometers. It, it's something that they just realized out of our work on the consultative forum with Nico, that they're actually making losses. They are not making any profitable business out of this uh, because they make more money uh, for shorter trips and they also have less wear and tear and operational costs if they are shorter trips. So this is ridiculous. And it's also happening with the... Uh, motorcycles, the commercial motorcycles, that they are applying routes for uh, trips meant for trains, actually, <laughs> 40 kilometers per hour and you're on a motorcycle, uh, just because there's no other way you can move faster in the city. Uh, from Edward also, the, the, the thing of how government is uh, relating with these people, with the MBTs, is exactly what's happening. I think we are still a little bit at the ignore stage, Edward. <laughs> we are still at that stage. Uh, we are still trying to push for more um, visibility, more respect, more space, more audience in a respective manner. Uh, but we are seeing that there's a positive uh, direction towards this. And the MBTs are more responsive uh, and more compliant compared to government side, to be honest. And, and that is what we are still struggling to seek a balance. Uh, the, the reason is that the uh, regulatory side, like Nick, uh, Nico mentioned, is still uh, not yet organized. Uh, right now, I think the MBTs are more organized than the government side. Uh, they, they are more looking forward to making better business, more getting organized because they are in the business and they are running it. But government is a little bit more uh, scared and within themselves, they still don't know how they should actually proceed who is going to be uh, taking the lead in this. So the regulatory part is still uh, 
where we need to crack something. And from uh, the SA experience, I think that that was also something that came out from the, uh, the, the perspectives where you have to shift and then also enabling the, the audience uh, to understand what you're trying to do in the changes. Uh, also, the MBTs will be here for longer probably than they are anywhere else <laughs> because of the land use uh, pattern and also because we've tried out different uh, buses, bus projects that have been in the system. At one point, we had 100 buses that caused a lot of fear and also brought some hope in the city that, oh, we are going to have a regulated bus system with tickets, with specific stops. But it didn't last, and the taxis were intimidated at first. Uh, they were striking, but now there's no bus that intimidates them because they know what to do, how to play their politics. And, and they are a bit worried about the buses coming in because they don't want to lose the roots in the improvements that we are having. Uh, so this is uh, something that we also share from the South African perspective. Even if, to be honest, BRT uh, was constructed tomorrow and then we had the pilot corridors running, the taxi still has a bigger role than the feeder role. And Nico has been saying it, it's beyond the feeder role. It will still have uh, a lot of trips on the main uh, BRT line. Um, false starts hard lessons. I think we've had something like this already, uh, especially the investors in the public transport system are making losses. If someone in, imports 100 buses and then the system collapses, I think that's something that is really, uh, it was a, a false start and it's a hard lesson. Uh, that's why government is a little bit scared and the ministry uh, is trying to make sure that the paratransit is prepared well enough before any other false start comes in before any other gambling happens. Um, there are some buses now plying and they look like scarecrows around on the road as if there's a system running, but they're also stuck uh, in the traffic. Some of them are running empty. And, and, and this is something that is kind of a false start, which our consultative forum is trying to avoid and help government not to go into, but also support the MBTs to have a better uh, business uh, improvement. Um, Nico again uh, mentioned something to do with the feeder distribution uh, and also collectivization and uh, co corporatization. This is also the stage where we are at. We are also learning from uh, Cape Town that these people have to be united. And before they get united, nothing will happen. So far, we have achieved something. And the other thing that uh, they are trying to uh, do also with Nico's support is to make sure that they formalize their umbrella organization and have a constitution, have clear rules, how, how they should share the positions, the places. So I think we are learning a lot more from uh, the South African experience, uh, but probably the governance side, I see that there's a difference there, which we might have to find a way of dealing with. The hierarchy of power, the hierarchy of the institutional capacities and the clarity of roles, who is supposed to do what? I think that confuses our MBT guys here that they don't have trust in the institutional capacity and ability to coordinate and organize them because there's, uh, it's like a, a child having too many orders from, uh, too many different orders from the, the parents and that can be so confusing that you don't know who to listen to, what to do, when not to do what. So they are in that kind of uh, state. So the governance uh, part, I think there's a lot of work to do and the capacity building. Uh, Nico hinted on the, training that is required. I think that has been asked for already by the MBTs, that they should be trained on how to improve, how to give the passenger a better service, how to make better business. They actually have learned a lot uh, right from the Cape Town trip, right from the uh, uh, trainings we've been having, Nico's talks. In fact, Nico, this is to inform you that next week we shall need you again in the continuation of the discussions. I hope you will be uh, with us. So this has been happening and uh, you see them interested in the subject matter uh, more, actually. They are moving faster than uh, the government side because the government was trying to organize them forcefully through elections and uh, have leadership structures, have a constitution which is led from the government side. But this did not happen um, because they moved ahead of government. They organized themselves they formed uh, an umbrella organization. 
they want to have their own constitution, they want to register themselves. So they have moved and now government is stuck with their process. They don't know how they can fit into the taxi movement already. So I think there's a little bit of a difference that uh, the drive is, the push is coming more from the real business people uh, in public transport, the, the MBTs. And lastly, I like the the DBSA uh, slide of the be the beautiful BRT. It looks very beautiful, too beautiful to be true. It's it's a lie that it's going to just uh, uh, land on Kampala roads, land on these streets in the next uh, two three years, and then perform as it is expected. It is a lie also to the taxis because they know what type of infrastructure they have, the, the networks where they have taken the passengers. Uh, so it looks really like something that scares them. But on the other hand, it's something that they know is not real. Uh, the BRT discussion, as you may know, Nico started in about 2011, 2012. It's now 20 years when these people are hearing about BRT, BRT. So it's like a song. So that's why we think that we are going to uh, benefit more if the consultative uh, forum prepares the MBT to improve within the changes that are coming up, no matter which system comes, whether BRT or not. I think to focus on them and empower them is something that we are uh, learning. And then lastly, the subsidy aspect. I think this is something we might have to discuss further on uh, because in my view, from my experience in these discussions, uh, government will not be in position to provide any subsidy. And I don't think it's recommendable uh, for us to do it. We've seen that these people, if they're organized, if they are orderly, if they don't have leakages in their businesses, they can actually sustain a system themselves. Currently, they are running it themselves anyway. They are not making so much uh, profit, but they are making profit. That's why the system is running. So the issue of subsidy is something that I wouldn't recommend uh, in our case. Uh, the system can be uh, improved upon and runs in a, a more sustainable way that it can be uh, around for some time and it's both business and a service uh, that is being provided to the public. I think, Simon, uh, this is all I can comment about uh, what has been shared from the perspective of Kampala. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amanda. And uh, if you can stay with us for a bit, we're now going to open the discussion. I know it's late in, uh, in Kampala. You can see it's dark behind you. Um, we're going to have about 20 minutes at least of a, of a, a discussion, a sort of a formal discussion. Then we have lunch outside. So you're also all invited to, to stay here, have lunch, and continue the discussion on a more uh, informal uh, basis. Um, so don't be frustrated if you cannot ask your question in, in the next 20 minutes. Uh, there will be time after. Um, who would like to start? Any questions, uh, reactions to the presenter, uh, presentations we've heard today? Okay, so we've got George, someone in the back, and someone on the left. Uh, George, Good. would you like to start? Yes, thank you, Simon. And first, I want to congratulate all of the speakers. I mean, fantastic presentations uh, and discussions. I learned a lot by listening to this. And I think I'm, I'm going to try to uh, reflect on a lot of these things because there are many pieces that are coming together. I think as, as, as you mentioned, Cyprian, you're creating uh, an asset class and a market. Uh, and the South African example in particular is very interesting. The question I had maybe for you, Cyprian, is you mentioned that there are certain market failures, right? That you're trying to address. One of them being information asymmetry. The commercial banks don't understand this business. Maybe the, the operators, they, they don't have the, the business know-how to communicate to, to others that, you know, that this is an organized business or that it can be profitable. Are there other asymmetries that you see that you think need to be resolved before this is a, a real market? Sure. Um, should we should we hear maybe the three questions and then uh, we'll see if we can bundle responses uh, in the back? Yes. Can yeah. you introduce yourself? Yes, yeah. my name is Jumana I'm at the International Transport Workers Federation. 
Um, unfortunately, my colleagues who would be the best to be here uh, are currently in Joburg, so they can't be here, but I'll, I'll definitely link them up to you afterwards. Tell them to go and uh, meet our colleagues at PRS. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> so uh, there are a couple of things just very quickly. One, to follow up on a point that Amanda made, and going back to the points of South Africa, um, I haven't been as involved as my colleagues have been, but my understanding of the situation in South Africa, from what I've been involved in in Durban, is when you talk about rail, there's a reason it's failed so badly, and it's because you've got issues around lack of reliability, vandalism, weapons. so the only people who use it are the ones who, who can't afford not to use it, right? So that's why, which is so it's a question of whether transferring the resource to, to, to BRT in this way is necessarily the right approach, and if we should... We should be continuing to look at issues like rail because it's the one that people who, who most need public transport are continuing to use even now. Mm -hmm. So that's one. And the other is when you're doing the planning or supporting the planning of BRT, I know there's been some issues around lack of taking into account what workers are saying. So, for example, in uh, I think Dar es Salaam, there was an issue where BRT was built, the one station was built in an area prone to flooding which then meant having huge problems, and that was because workers had been ignored in the planning process. So my question is, how are you taking account of existing climate reality and worker experiences as you're planning out these things? Thank you. Thank you. And our colleague from our KFW, I think. Yes, so I'm going to run right off from KFW Development Bank. It was very, very interesting, all these uh, uh, presentations. I learned a lot, and uh, especially what you presented here reminds me of the case uh, some seven, eight years ago, we uh, prepared a project uh, with the DBSA exactly, exactly on uh, uh, changing diesel buses to uh, biogas buses and L uh, ZNG buses. It was exactly giving a promotional launch through DBSA to the bus owners. And we did a pre preparation study and we did exactly like you did. We looked very much in detail and tried to communicate with the bus owners what is your business model. And we came out with I would say similar results, but it was also very interesting to see that you have to go into detail. We also got, went through details on different uh, vehicle times, different route length, and so on, and came exactly to the thing that it depends very much on the business case. And these guys told us if what you are doing, changing the bus uh, engine, uh, if it's possible, profitable to us, wonderful, we do it. If not, forget it. Mm. Uh, at the end, it came out that it was not so profitable. Especially one issue, which is, uh, I think, relevant when it's on changing to a new combustion engine. Maybe it's now with a discussion on electrical engines. It was the remaining value. We told us, okay, if you give us now uh, biogas-driven buses, what we are now doing, when our buses are at the end of a life period, we sell it in the rural area. And the price, or the money we get, is a very substantial part of our whole calculation. It's very interesting. You see, when you have an, a new technology, it changes the business model. Mm -hmm. Now, what I would be interesting, I think it's also very interesting to see on the BRD case uh, what problems you have. I think this is very relevant for us as a bilateral development bank. When we bring in these new, very expensive systems, we need to integrate it in the existing systems. And we saw from what you did all, this is a very extensive work. And I see from our colleagues, I mean, we have huge requirements on social and environmental issues. We have to provide a social environmental plan to do measures to be protective. I wonder, I think if you disturb an existing system, it's a social issue. I think it's not yet part of the social and environmental protection plans. Maybe it should at least be mentioned that something has to be done. But when I think from a, a bank like us, we have to put a lot of effort and this means a lot of money and time. It can uh, delay the whole investment. It's the same like when you have resettlement. It's always a, a pain in the ass, so to say. It's, it's, it's awful. And with this, it's even more complicated. So I think this is an issue which has to be considered because it also refers to demand. And demand is money which pays back the investment. Uh, but how to handle this and handle it in a professional way that we don't lose too much time for the whole investment it's a very, uh, sorry, very crucial issue for all these big investments also be profitable at the, at the end. Okay, thank you very much. Um, let's uh, hear from our panelists on these three questions, maybe starting with you, Cyprian, uh, on, on George's question in particular, and then we have uh, topics on the workers' conditions, uh, uh, social safeguards, and, and technology. I don't know who will just take that. Yes, uh, thank you for that question. So our very first observation was 
<coughs> at an individual owner level, say, what's going on? Um, you go around and you say, how did you buy your taxes? Who funded you? And they say, I pledged my house to get funding from a bank. Uh, so the bank basically is not interested in knowing his business. Rather, they say, I've got cover in his house. His money, and they take that house. So this guy knows a bit of information at an individual level, but he protects it because that is uh, basically cut to compete with the next guy and the next guy. As well. So you've isolated pockets of valuable information that's not shared with anybody. Mm. And that doesn't help anyone because then they operate individually and bring in inefficiencies mm. in the sense that he pays his transaction costs and he pays for that information for himself mm. and similarly like that. As a collective, they will probably make massive savings by sharing information and transmitting that information to a financier. And this is why their role is to unpack what's going on. So asymmetries exist at individual level and that business level. Then you take it further. There are other asymmetries in the licensing processes. What is required? What does it take? Um, and I can bet you people on the same route have had to pay different amounts of money, all kinds of money, for a similar license. So there are all these inefficiencies networked into it. At the very basic level, very basic level, the owner does not know what the driver is making and vice versa. How is that going to work? So it's permeated with inefficiencies because of buckets of isolated information and so and we think that this is the only way to break it put it all into one you can't even say that's my taxi we will fund the operating company we will ask for a capital structure that requires that they put all their equity which they don't disclose by the way whether it's by way of vehicle vehicles or the value of the license or whatever else subsidy will come in future we haven't included it now but the point is this we are demanding that it be done in a certain way. But the way we're doing it, we're not prescribing. They have approached us to say, we have this, we have this, what can you build for us? Thank you. <clears throat> on uh, the, the impact on workers, uh, change of technology and social safeguards, do other panelists want to respond? I'm happy to respond. Maybe Eddie, you want to go first? No, go yeah. first, then I'll follow. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take a little bit of poetic license and reinterpret because I think there's a number of issues rolled up in, in, in the question. The first thing, let me just say, of course, we need mass transit modes in sub-Saharan cities. Let's not, let's not fool ourselves. I think you've got to look very context specific here. The decline of rail in South Africa, I'm not a rail expert. I just look at the level of effort and, in a way, believability. Do the public, the public transport users, actually believe that we are going to rehabilitate rail in spite of the amount of money that everybody they don't? Okay, so what's happened? Once that modal shift has happened to the to road-based transport, I think it's very difficult, even if you can do all the technical things to bring rail back. You know, so in my view, in situ upgrade and this kind of debate we have in here. Why should the paratransit supply mode be restricted to a vehicle type? In South Africa, we define the paratransit out of operating a bus. It's crazy. That law must be changed. You know, these people should be running 65-seater vehicles you know, on the trip lessons they do. So I, I, that's just at the technical level. In terms of participation in planning, let me say something quickly. Uh, when you get down to community level and employee level, etc. That's that's a little bit more tricky. The the South African approach to BRT implementation of 10 years ago that I was pretty much involved with had a couple of big benefits. Number one, you had guaranteed modal shift. <laughs> um, but more importantly, we could take the incumbent taxi operators whose businesses were going to be affected and we could bring them into the room. In fact, what we did, we got them into a bus with the planners. Planners work with things called ME models and things like that. They don't necessarily always go onto the ground. And we said, let's go and drive the route that you want us as the future operator of the BRT to, to operate. And then we stopped and we get out and we said, here, 
Can you see the shacks? The bus can't operate here. I nearly said the planner's name. <laughs> okay, so then you get meaningful participation at operational level. Also, the taxi operators, if you involve them in this, Amanda will tell you, they know their passenger. They live where their passenger lives. So that, that level of participation in planning, I think we, we, we did um, achieve in the first phase of BRT implementation in South Africa. And, and just to say, I wasn't obviously, I, was, I, mean, I don't know that particular piece, I don't know about what happened in South Africa specifically. Yeah. I've seen in other cities yeah. where there has that level of involvement and there's been problems as a result. And so my question is really, how do you make sure that across the board we have a standard that yeah. you are having that level of involvement yeah. and avoiding problems down the road? So that's a wider question really. For me, and then I'll wrap up, I think it starts with the integrity of if you bring up a large-scale public transport improvement to Kampala, to Accra, wherever, what is the integrity with which you go, you know? And if your starting point is, I'm going to ignore or disregard the incumbent operators, you're already on a hiding second to life. That's your gateway to meaningful participation in my, in my And that should be done up front, not after the fact. Absolutely. Stated up front is integrity in your process, I spoke earlier on about where's the sources of data, you know. It sits with the power transit, they're moving the people. But if they in the process and there's integrity in the process, you know, wonderful to work with them. Can I just add to that? I mean, I think I mean on this on this point about stakeholder engagement, which I think for any urban mobility project, but especially one that is going to involve this particular sector or as a mass transit project uh, and from the perspective of the World Bank, if I can say, I mean, we we see this as integral to the, the social impact assessment. And I think we've learned actually quite a lot from the experience of ITF, you know, different places like Nairobi and, and others, how to build this into our process. You know? I think there's a lot to learn, as you said, Nico, if you're starting out by not talking to the people that are going to operate part of the system, you already uh, you're already several steps behind uh, and mapping these stakeholders in the beginning is clearly the very first step, right? And understanding how they're, as many speakers have said, how do they operate? What, what are their incentives? I, I can maybe just come in with one addition to this. So it looks like it's a joint response to the two questions. Mm. But the process um, is you know, I think we need to we need to pause a little bit and think about the process that we follow, because there are stages in preparing a public transport program, uh, and oftentimes too quickly. We want to know what it's going to look like at the end, with you know, without leaving space for an exploratory exercise up front. Which is difficult to do. I mean, realistically, in a in a sort of development finance program, you know, uh, first you need to know how much are you going to lend. Is it going to be three hundred or two hundred? Is it one hundred? What are we What are we targeting? What room is there in that process to say, okay, I don't know what we're going to do. If you don't know, you know, I need to start by understanding what is happening now. We have to remember that. All of the sort of most magnificent public transport systems around the world, the ones that we all refer to, Singapore, Vienna, these kinds of places that have amazing systems. They didn't start with amazing public transport systems, right? They started with bus routes 100 years ago, 150 years ago. So this city as well has got a really nice public transport system. It didn't build it all in one go. It took a very long time to get there, right? But we seem to expect African cities to take on massive loans and then build all of this overnight. And we know already what it's going to look like because we designed it that way, you know? Um, you know, it's just, it, I, I think almost like uh, there's perhaps not a commitment for a discussion around what can we do to, instead of imposing a vision on a city, allow that city to evolve from where it is? You know, you have operations, people are moving around already, right? Don't necessarily, this is the lesson from South Africa. Don't come in and then want to replace this. Oh, and now everybody here must just somehow 
join our thing because you know uh, that's how this is going to work. No, I mean, why is it not possible to start and say, okay, well, here we've got a pinch point. Who was pointing out the pinch points in Cairo, right? Say, so, okay, well, let's put in a dedicated lane there and then allow the vehicles that are already there to use that facility, right? And it's cheap, low impact. You target the problem and you evolve your system from there. What we're doing in Pretoria really is an evolution from informal to formal, right? Yes. I don't know if it's going to work out excellent. You know, I, I think it will be good, you know, but who knows where from, from there. You can imagine if this one association, we're working on 20 buses, right? That's all we're doing. But this association, I can tell you now, this week, the WhatsApp messages are coming in. They are already getting interest from external equity, right? You say, oh, wow, what you guys are doing really cool. We want to buy a share in your company, right? <laughs> and and you know, the, the company was formed two weeks ago. So, uh, so uh, you know, now that opens up a space. Because now with that equity investment, they can maybe say, okay, well, we want to buy that piece of land and build a taxi rank for our passengers, right? And attract more passengers to our service. It will be, it's amazing how quickly the conversation changes from we're a service provider to we own a transport company. Um, and that's the evolution that we'd like to see. And there's nothing wrong with government coming in and then supporting that evolution from taxi to something that at the end perhaps can resemble very closely a BRT, yeah. right? But you didn't start by saying we're going to build BRT. You start by saying we're going to make changes to the public transport system. Thank you. Can I put a bumper sticker on that? Can I put a bumper sticker on this? Yes, and then we'll take a okay. couple more questions. So, so in my experience, and it goes to your part of your question, we still have too much of a logistics mindset in public transport and too little of a people mindset. But the power transport, for all its sins, is actually a people-driven mode. They very much in touch with the communities that they serve. They help the auntie with her shopping bags, you know. So for me, we can learn that from the power transit. They don't think logistics, they think people. Mm. So I can I just very quick, tiny, very quickly, just yeah. I don't think this is just about safeguards. Mm. This is the stakeholder engagement is about reduce, identifying and reducing costs. And I think we don't, if we keep keeping stakeholder, stakeholder engagement as a safeguards issue, actually missing a huge area of efficiency. So I think sure. we need to understand yeah. that. Yeah. Do we have other questions? And I also want to ask the online audience, uh, if you have questions, you can even you can either ask them in the chat or, uh, or elsewhere. Uh, okay, uh, why don't we do Jean-Charles, Jackie, in this order. <laughs> okay, uh, it, it was, thank you for what you said. I mean, it was very powerful. But then it raises a question, I mean, why now? Why is the change taking place now? I mean, uh, South Africa is in there for quite a while. I mean, it should have taken place before mm -hmm. for um, Working on Ghana, maybe because it's working, it's a good model. Ghana, you have the sense that things, things are not changing. Mm -hmm. So, why is this not happening? Okay. No, normally. Okay. And then that, that really is also a question for Sikrenians. I mean, normally in such a business, I mean, leasing should be the solution. I mean, because leasing, I mean, bridges the gap between the small entrepreneur and, and uh, the, in the investors, you know. Are small, but uh, but uh, but uh, you, you have a value added from the leasing company. So, what is the status of leasing in South Africa? Why it is not providing the financing that your workers need? Okay, thank you, Jackie. Can I ask you to keep your questions relatively? Uh, <laughs> Wait, I'm trying to be really quick. Um, I'm curious about George. George is not a BRT, to my understanding. Mm -hmm. You had it on that. It's, it's a much smaller city, it's pushed back, it said, no, I'm going to work with the operators and then build a bus system. It was the only upward slope of ridership, so I'm just wondering if you could just mention the George model, because I think it's a, it's a little bit different. And just for Tamara, I just want to say, um, in your business models and your research, did you discover cross-subsidization? So a lot of these... Um, Minibus taxis are used to take people to funerals, to carry goods, and that actually is part of the way they, they remain viable. 
Mm. Um, so, and I think that's like really, really important to consider. So, and I'll stop there. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Hi, Emma Stevenson from Shell Foundation. Um, so, we've worked with companies like Tegende and Asset Financing for two wheelers. Um, they're exploring the Matatu space as well. Uh, we've worked with these Matatu for the formalization of the informal in Uganda. Um, I think that there are some technologies and solutions that the private sector can offer here. Um, but I think it's really impressive the way that you've approached this problem and the data that you shared is hugely insightful. Um, and I think there's there's something here about the combination that might be of interest to you. And I think the model of the program office uh, to deliver these finance and solutions to market is really in the person who's we've explored before incentives, guarantees to banks, and we have high level agreement and it sounds wonderful, but actually executing it with the team is where it falls flat. So I think that the TA and building a capacity to deliver that is really promising. So just a question on the role of the private sector and the collaboration opportunities with technology that exists already. Okay, thank you. And we have, uh, sorry, don't in the back. Yeah. It's Nyaga uh, from <coughs> Sustainable Transport Africa, based in Nairobi. Um, having listened to the presentations from uh, South Africa, I think there's so many parallels. You think that the operators go to the same college. <laughs> <laughs> they do. <laughs> yeah. uh, the College of Hard Knocks. I'm not sure where it's based. <laughs> but um, there's been a lot of talk about multimodal uh, transport. Multimodal, uh, yeah, transport. And uh, of course, we, we expect that. Uh, uh, commuters will have a choice when, when, uh, between uh, various uh, modes of transport when they, when they want to go to places. And uh, Nairobi, uh, there's the BRT project, I think we've probably they've been talking about it for the last maybe 15 years. And uh, I've seen a few stops being created. And uh, my question to uh, Nico, the gentleman, is that, uh, well, South Africa has had a long experience of uh, operating BRT. Um, and what we have heard in Nairobi is that when BRT is created, the paratransit will be removed and go to this, so just feed us. Um, in South Africa, do they run side by side? <laughs> and if they do, uh, what's the result? Yeah. Uh, are people, uh, uh, are they equal? Okay, obviously from the presentation, they're not equal in the formula, but uh, what's, what's the result when they're running side by side? <laughs> Can we just stop with these four and then we'll, if we have time, we'll take another batch, but uh, who wants to? I'd love to tackle that last one first. <laughs> so uh, I, uh, I confess my sins. Is, uh, I worked at the city of Cape Town when they were planning the bus rapid transit. I was involved in most aspects of the deployment of that my city system. We made a lot of mistakes. We were figuring this out as we go along. We had people coming from outside. One person tells us this, the other person tells us that. You know, you've got to get this thing done, so we get it done. Um, on your question, do they run side by side? The, this is one of the reasons uh, why we're looking at minibus taxi evolution in South Africa now, because BRT has not worked. Um, it is too expensive well, at least in South Africa, um, the premise was originally that this thing will pay for itself. You don't need to pay anything. Uh, the feeders are going to cost a bit more, but the trunk routes make enough money to pay for the whole thing, so it's cost neutral. Almost from the start, within a month of beginning planning, we had to go to city councils and ask them, we, we're not going to make it. We, we need a subsidy, operating subsidy. National Department said it's not our business, we're gonna give you the capital, you must find the operating money for this thing. And uh, so cities were left very much in the lurch by national government. Cape Town went and got 6% or 4, 4 point something percent of property tax rates to run its system, uh, which it gets now. Uh, and the intention was, and every city got similar amounts, Durban went for 8% of property tax rates, 8% uh, to operate the system. Uh, in Cape Town, as it turns out, uh, phase one of four phases, which took phase one, I mean, uh, like 12 years to build, right? 
swallowed the whole four percent. So now the next question is, oh, okay, what are we going to do now? Where are we going to get the money to run the other three phases from? Um, don't know. So what do you do? Well, now you need to find an alternative. Okay, there's all these taxes around. Let's see what we can do with that. So that, I hope, to provide some context to your question. Why has it not happened before? Because the realization is now, at least initially, okay, well, we will keep the trunk routes for the next phase because those are the ones that make money. Right? And then we'll kick the minibus taxis off those trunk routes and they can try and make money on the feeder route somewhere. Right? And then, by the way, they can provide a nice feeder service to the trunk routes as well. You know, and then that's how that's going to work. And that will cut the BRT ops costs down, right? For the, and, uh, and the whole thing will then make money. And we don't have to pay them because they are running, you know. Then um, you asked the question do they run in parallel? Uh, yes, they run in parallel. Um, illegally, um, because remember, all of their licenses were bought out as part of the uh, establishment of the operators. They formed part of it, the, but uh, very quickly thereafter, on almost all the trunk routes, uh, they took the payouts that they received uh, for the for the licenses. And they went straight to the to the other dealership and bought a new bus. Um, <laughs> So uh, uh, you often find that directors of the vehicle operating company, right, okay. is getting paid on this side because there's a minimum right, a minimum payment guarantee in that contract, right? They get paid irrespective of whether he's running a kilometer or not. And then on this side, uh, he's got his own van running in competition with his own business. Yeah, I just to just right. to add on that question on whether the taxes are running parallel to BRT, yes, Ed is rightfully saying illegally so they do, but also out of need. Yes. Because the passenger passenger trip is journey is longer than the BRT network. So it's taking much longer and it's more expensive to expand the BRT network. To allow for the passenger to take BRT from yeah. from A to Z, so somewhere in between you find the parallel. So what means what means then for the passenger it makes sense for me to get into a taxi. So while they're running um, illegally along the BRT, it's also out of a need. There's something you can, this that's the this, something that the the, the, the municipality cannot do about. Also, the integration part. Of the BRT failed. So if we had, after implementing the BRT, go back to the very um, purpose of creating an integrated public transport network, the BRTs were all dumped in cities without integrating with other systems. So if you're not integrating, you're going to force others to, to compete with you. And taxis have been winning the competition throughout the continent. So making everything redundant and inefficient. So that's that's the problem we're trying to deal with now in solving the paratransit so that you're able to integrate it with other systems. Thank you. I think Sam wants to comment. Uh, yeah, it's just a comment, not a question. Uh, I want to agree with uh, everything Nico said in this point about logistics. If you start with the concept of what BRT is, it's the gold standard and everything else is junk. Don't do it. The only thing worse than that is every corridor needs monorail, light rail, heavy rail, metro, maglev, not war, etc. The starting point should not be the image of a mode. The starting point should be what's the problem you're trying to solve? And the problem you're trying to solve in a complex corridor in an urban area and frankly, I think in Africa, the corridors from a market perspective are more complicated than they are in a traditional CBD-focused European city or CBD-focused Washington, D.C. There is a mix of land uses. There is a mix of short trips and a mix of long trips. And if you design a BRT system that has to look like Bogota, Bogota's station spacing, it's going to do a crappy job of serving the short trips mm -hmm. with turnover yeah. that are much better served by other kinds of services. 
And the things that define a transport system are the service pattern, the operating approach, and the business model. Don't borrow everything from a city other than your own. Start with figuring out, with good data collection, what the problem is. Planning isn't figuring out how to implement the gold standard, or even sillier, how to implement the how train. But planning starts with what's the problem I'm trying to solve, and what's the appropriate solution? And the solution is defined, first of all, by a service pattern that reflects the market for mobility and the situation on the ground in terms of operations, labor, communities, land use, et cetera. So I think that was an outstanding question, and we sort of danced around it. The people, forgive me about South Africa, the people that parachuted in there from the Upper West Side of New York, if you'll pardon me, <laughs> and from Bogota, <laughs> said anything other than Bogota or anything other than Curitiba, no good. It's, the, it's not even as good as a bronze. Yes. And therefore, we, the, the service pattern that was implemented and the assumptions made about the nature of the market, the financial viability, were invalid. And there's no reason that that has to be repeated. Mm -hmm. And Eddie and company and people today working on the project are sort of cleaning up from that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, thank thank you. You. absolutely. Yeah. We, had, we had a question and uh, that Cyprian yeah. wants to, to address. Yes, uh, the, the question uh, to do with uh, the, the normal way of financing this is through um, leasing finance. And I showed two a slide wherein we had unpacked two leasing companies in this business. In fact, their basically uh, predatory behavior um, makes them charge twice what should be charged. Uh, they basically take all, all the profit from an operator. And that operator has no recourse. And when we looked at it, uh, we said, no, we can intervene. It's because there's just few of them offering leasing finance in this space and they are listed company like the master and and basically they are actually in a relationship with one association which makes it complicated uh, because it's 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 incestuous basically uh, that relationship uh, so it's, it's unfair practice by a large leasing company charging twice as much rates hence uh, the commuters uh, you know the operators are not making money from new vehicles from that leasing company. Thank you. Can I respond I, to Jackie's question, I, George? I want to take a okay. question uh, online. <laughs> we do have an online audience. Uh, and so it's uh, Emmanuel Domer. Are you able to unmute no and ask it? Sorry? Emmanuel Mogaji. Oh, Emmanuel Mogaji. Oh, sorry. It's not the same Emmanuel. <laughs> Emmanuel Mogaji. Are you, are you able to unmute and ask your question? Yes. Can you hear me? <clears throat> Um, yes, loud and clear. Yes, uh, uh, thank you so much for this platform and the, the engagement so far. I just wanted to reflect on the on the experience of the drivers. So the informal drivers that sometimes feels BRT is encroaching into their business area. So we see they often operate illegally. So do we, do stakeholders really try to understand their perspective in this? So not just about the BRT that wants to bring the boss, the government that wants to invest, but how about those people, maybe I would call them like the indigenous yeah. drivers, the real owners. How do we manage the expectations and how do we integrate them into this new BRT system that sometimes feels is encroaching into their business? Like they are pushing them into the illegal side pushing them into the feeder roads. How do you manage and sort of uh, deal with those kind of situations? Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. Can we have one response to, to that? All right, quickly. Only one. Um, so in terms of Emmanuel's question, different sub-Saharan cities have very different configurations in terms of owner-driver arrangements. Uh, let, me, let me respond from the South African perspective with us. When BRT or bigger improvement comes, you first have to deal with the owner. The owner owns the operating license, has a right in law. That's very really important. Um, I know in other 
in other cities that I've worked in, drivers and driver unions are very important because of owners are often what I call absent landlords in many other cities. So you can never really surface the owners and sit across the table and do a deal with them. Um, Emmanuel, to, to answer you, the BRT implementation in South Africa, again, good, bad and ugly. But one of the good things about that is all the affected owners got brought in, they got bought out, compensation paid, they used the compensation to invest in the bus operating companies, they became the shareholders in the companies, and all the drivers underwent fitness assessment, fitness in inverted commas, um, and driver training, license upgrades, etc., etc. So we tried to make the whole transition in South Africa neutral from an impact on employment. And in fact, then drivers ended up with you know formal conditions of employment similar to that of other public transport uh, um, drivers. Um, so there's a model, it comes at a price, it, it comes with a level of effort, but that's the way we dealt with it. So the impact was, was neutral in terms of job losses. Mm. Thank you, you Nico. Quickly touch on the George one. So, so I'll go George, Jackie. Can, can we, can yeah. I suggest, um, since it's a specific question, okay. you can tackle it over, over lunch. But, but uh, it, it is generic. The good news, <laughs> the good news <laughs> is, the good part of go George, highly participated, operate the impact model. Okay, yeah. so the operators are the, are the operators of the new system. The downside is, it's the provincial government of the Western Cape that runs the project. The project is highly subsidized. So when you see the ridership grow up, because it's a highly subsidized project, they're using PTOG funding, public transport operating grant funding to keep the project going. Thank so you. It's not viable. Thank you. Amanda, I will see your hand is up. Do you want to come in? Very, very briefly, please, because we are at the end of our session. Yeah, thank you, Simon, and thank you, everyone. I just wanted to comment on uh, the issue of the social aspect. In fact, for us, that's the biggest aspect. That's the biggest threat, the issue of uh, stakeholder engagement. And uh, I think we should learn from what Nico has shared, that they had to take the bus and move around and participate with the people on the ground. Uh, again, from Edward, the issue of evolution and not imposing systems is a more sustainable approach. Uh, we might look like we are so desperate to have uh, something better for the public, for the city, but I think it might be very superficial for us. So I think it's a good lesson. I see we have some people from Uganda, like Mr. Katushabe Winston, who is in the public transport planning at the Ministry of Works. And also um, from, uh, from one of the people in the audience there, I think from the bank who talked about the social aspect and inclusion what kind of investment would that be if the public was not involved do not borrow everything from other cities kampala for example cannot be bogota nairobi cannot be bogota we cannot be what we are not and the structures are completely different so government has to come down and appreciate those differences and fit within the running systems of the cities the last one is about the feeder road issue this is a very good input from uh, this meeting because they don't like that word because it puts them off the network, off the system, kind of, that they are just chipping in to, to, to provide the service. And they also ask questions like, where exactly are we feeding in from? Where is the feeder point? Have we tried it out? Does it have passengers? Where are the terminals? Uh, are they actually there? Can we look at the terminals where we are going to be uh, feeding in from? Then the mistakes from the past from elsewhere. I think we are very privileged, uh, Nairobi, Kampala, and other African cities that have not yet tried to do this. We are privileged to learn from the mistakes of elsewhere. And I think we should look at them as wealth for us in the planning process. Thank you very much, Simon. Thank you, Amanda. So with that, we close the, the formal part of our discussion. Um, thanks a lot to our presenters, to uh, you also, Amanda, presenting online, to the online audience, to all of you who came.